Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Virtual Journal Club. I'm really uh, excited th this morning to be covering a topic um, which we all encounter in everyday clinical medicine related to um, the challenge of uh, managing both thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer um, in pregnancy. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Spiruta um, Maraca, who is an assistant professor um, at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and she also works at the Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System. Uh, she is a clinician scientist and serves as the program director for the Endocrinology Fellowship Program um, in Little Rock. In addition to her postgraduate fellowship in endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic, she, was also, she also obtained a master's degree in clinical and translational science. Um, uh, of note, she is co-founder of the Knowledge and Evalu um, Education Research, uh, or I'm sorry, Evaluation Research Unit in Endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic, and she continues um, to have an appointment as a research collaborator in that unit. Um, Dr. Maraca's research is focused on hypothyroidism in pregnancy, as well as subclinical hypothyroidism in older adults. Um, she serves on the editorial boards of both thyroid and clinical thyroidology. And so with that, it is really my extreme pleasure to introduce Dr. Maraca, and I will again encourage all of you to take advantage of Dr. Maraca's expertise in this area, and um, if you can write in your questions, I will do my very best to get to all of them at, as time allows at the end of the hour. So uh, thank you once again for agreeing to join with us, Dr. Maraca, and look forward to your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Organ, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I've watched a few of the virtual journal clubs and I have learned so much. I'm really honored for this invitation to talk today about thyroid nodule assessment and management uh, during pregnancy. Uh, let me uh, advance. Okay, here we are. I have no disclosures. Um, and for those who have never visited, here you can get a visual of the UMS campus at Little Rock. Uh, next to uh, UMS uh, stands the Central Arkansas VA. They are connected with a bridge. And somewhere around there, you can find my office with a very beautiful view of the Little Rock downtown. Uh, now that we have completed our little tour, let's start. Uh, thyroid nodules are discrete lesions within the thyroid gland. Based on their size and location, uh, they may be clinically detectable or subclinical, where you only detect it by imaging. They may arise in a normal thyroid gland or in the context of a goiter. And many of you may have heard that we are facing a thyroid nodule epidemic. The prevalence of thyroid nodules uh, depends on the modality for detecting them. So by physical exam, it has estimated that the prevalence about 6%, uh, increasing to 16, 18% for UCT or MRI, and up to 72% uh, when we use an ultrasound with higher frequencies in women and in the elderly. It is estimated that about 160 to 200 million people in the United States actually have a thyroid nodule. And I believe you would agree that uh, this is a significantly high number, especially if you think that a diagnosis of thyroid nodule could lead to unnecessary medical tests and treatments and could increase medical costs and patients' anxiety. So imagine if this diagnosis comes during a vulnerable time, such as pregnancy, when women and their families want to make sure that everything is going to be perfect. Um, women are actually more likely compared to men uh, to have a thyroid nodule, and the incidence increases with age and parity. Other risk factors include iodine deficiency and radiation. And FNAs are routinely used for the evaluation of uh, patients with thyroid nodules. A few years ago, it was estimated that in the US uh, alone, more than 600,000 uh, FNAs are uh, done per year. Uh, and worldwide, probably this number is in the millions. Um, and the fact is that 95% of these FNAs will yield a benign cytology result. So the incidence of thyroid cancer is rising all over the world. Um, the increase 
is affecting all ethnic and age groups with an increased risk among women uh, below 45 years old. Using uh, SEER data, uh, you can see that uh, there's a steady increase of the age-adjusted incidence of thyroid cancer in US, particularly for women uh, with an estimated rate of 17.8 per 100,000, which is three times more one of what we see in men. And you can see this graph is restricted to uh, women to ages less than 50. So because of the high number of women diagnosed with thyroid nodules um, with and differentiated thyroid cancer during the reproductive years. Most endocrinologists and headache and neck surgeons, ENTs, will treat women who are diagnosed uh, with thyroid nodules or thyroid cancer during pregnancy. However, in contrast to the extensive uh, literature um, for uh, thyroid nodules in general, very few studies have focused on the pregnant population. Um, I, I did a presentation about a year and a half ago for thyroid nodules, and you can see um, that, that uh, PubMed search had yielded about 13,000 publications. I repeated this a few days ago, and the number had increased almost like by 1,500. But then when you look on specifically thyroid nodules in pregnancy, um, the same search just showed 228 results. And then when you look by year, you see that there's a few years that there was a, a spike, uh, but then this didn't um, continue. So uh, for uh, today, I will review briefly the epidemiology of thyroid nodules in pregnancy, and uh, I will discuss the evaluation steps for thyroid nodules in this population, review the available uh, medical evidence for the management of pregnant women with thyroid nodules. And my goal is that at the end of this presentation, you will be able to use the current medical evidence to provide patient-centered care for pregnant women with thyroid nodules. This is a simplified representation of what happens to the thyroid physiology during pregnancy that I think will help our discussion. Um, during pregnancy, uh, the placenta is uh, secreting um, the HCG, um, and HCG and TSH are both glucoproteins that consist of two uh, subunits. The alpha subunit um, is nearly identical, and uh, although the beta subunits are distinct, there is a 38% um, sequence identity there too. As a result, uh, there's cross reactivity between HCG and TSH. So HCG can uh, bind to the TSH receptor and stimulate the thyroid to produce thyroid hormones. So we'll see a sharp increase um, in the 3 4 especially in the first trimester. And through negative feedback, um, the pituitary decreases the secretion of TSH. Um, at the same time, we have increase in the estrogen levels that um, result in an increase in the peroxin binding globulin. Uh, and then uh, this leads to further increase in the T4 levels and further decrease in the TSH levels. This is important to remember because uh, a TSH in a pregnant woman that it might be lower than the normal reference range for your institution may not actually represent a truly low level. Um, thyroxine metabolism uh, increases uh, during pregnancy um, with, through the D2 and D3 deodinase um, um, activity, and there's also increase in the renal iodine clearance. Um, so uh, it is estimated that the daily iodine requirements increase by 50% during pregnancy. So pregnancy is, in essence, a stress test for the thyroid. Um, studies have shown that uh, depending on the iodine intake, thyroid volume may increase by 10% um, in pregnancy for normal uh, to high iodine intake um, uh, areas and up to 40% in the low iodine intake areas. Um, so epidemiological data uh, suggests that this low uh, iodine intake um, could affect the thyroid function in pregnancy and uh, could also be disposed to the development of thyroid nodules. Uh, therefore, it's, it's highly recommended um, to uh, supplement in pregnancy with 150 micrograms of iodine daily in the form of uh, potassium iodide. And um, 
in, in addition to the iodine uh, deficiency, um, other factors may be playing um, a role in the increase in the, of the thyroid volume. Uh, so it has been uh, stipulated that calcitonin and uh, growth factors such as HF1 and um, epidermal growth factor uh, could uh, also have uh, a role in this. So um, with this in mind, you, you may wonder how pregnancy affects the prevalence uh, of thyroid nodules. Um, a few studies aim to assess and uh, this and even examine if pregnancy could lead to an increase in the size of thyroid nodules. So let's take a look. Um, this study by uh, Glenoir in 1991 evaluated uh, 726 uh, pregnancies and found a prevalence of uh, 3% for thyroid nodules. In this study, the total thyroid volume uh, remained stable, uh, but it was noted that 60% uh, of the thyroid nodules doubled in size. However, this was uh, representing uh, microcysts of 5 to 12 millimeters in size, and they were not uh, even palpable. Uh, it was also noted in this study that there were uh, four patients that developed uh, new nodules. Um, in uh, a few years later, um, uh, uh, Dr. Kung um, published their study uh, evaluating uh, 221 pregnancies. Uh, in the first semester, the prevalence of thyroid nodules was uh, 15%. And uh, women with uh, thyroid nodules were, were older and had a higher parity. Uh, they, uh, there was an increase in the nodular volume uh, throughout pregnancy, but then returned to baseline. And then the maximum diameter of dominant nodule actually was stable. Uh, you can see here in the, in the figure how uh, moving through trimesters, more uh, women are found to have thyroid nodules. And uh, by the end of uh, pregnancy, uh, three months postpartum, 24% uh, of the population uh, had thyroid nodules. Uh, interestingly, uh, 21 nodules underwent the FNA and were found to be benign. Um, so this study demonstrated that at least in this sample, pregnancy was not a risk factor for thyroid nodule growth uh, or the, the, there were no concerns for uh, malignant transformation, which provides somewhat uh, some reassurance. So uh, more recently, uh, uh, this study um, uh, in Italy uh, by um, Vanucci evaluated the 155 uh, pregnant women in Italy uh, and followed them um, up to six months postpartum. Uh, 108 uh, women completed the follow-up. Um, all women reported uh, supplementary iodine intake uh, by iodized salt, and 39% uh, were actually on uh, vitamin uh, supplementation, including iodine. Uh, in this study, 17% uh, of women uh, were found to have uh, thyroid nodules, um, no nodules increased, and uh, there was one um, new uh, uh, six millimeter solid nodule found. Um, the thyroid gland size increased, uh, as you can see, from um, second to third trimester, but uh, returned to normal postpartum. And the thyroid gland size uh, was found to be related to weight gain, um, but interesting note with the calcitonin levels, which remain pretty much stable throughout pregnancy. Um, in, in this study, also, there was a, a mild increase in the TSH level uh, when we went from the first trimester uh, to the second uh, trimester. Um, so the, the next uh, question is whether um, then in, in pregnancy, when a woman has a thyroid nodule, would this mean more chances that this could be a, a thyroid cancer? Um, uh, this uh, is still um, an uh, ongoing uh, question. Um, three retrospective um, studies uh, have um, looked into this. Uh, in these studies, uh, the prevalence of uh, thyroid cancer in pregnancy uh, ranges from 12 to 43%. Um, however, um, 
in, in these studies, um, it is possible that there was some selection bias leading to this uh, uh, more than expected um, uh, prevalence of thyroid cancer. Uh, since um, these studies were conducted in tertiary uh, reference hospitals, so the women with cancer may have been overrepresented. Uh, and then uh, the study by Kung that I uh, showed you earlier um, was a population-based um, um, study. Uh, and in this one, there was um, basically 0% of um, uh, thyroid cancer since all nodules were found to be benign. Um, the final study uh, consisted by uh, the, uh, this um, from Smith and um, uh, based on California, the California Cancer Registry, and in this one, the prevalence of thyroid cancer in pregnancy was 14.4 uh, uh, per 100,000 live births, uh, with most of the diagnosis uh, made within one year uh, postpartum. So um, let's let's proceed with the case. Um, a 24-year-old pregnant woman uh, in her first pregnancy uh, presents to uh, her gynecologist uh, for the first prenatal visit uh, at the 10th gestational week. Uh, she reported no uh, past medical history. Her family history was negative for thyroid disease. And uh, in review of systems, uh, her only complaint was uh, fatigue. Uh, specifically, she denied any dysphagia, dysphonia, or dyspnea. Uh, and then on physical exam, uh, she was noted to have a 1.5 centimeter right thyroid nodule, um, was painless, uh, was mobile with swallowing, and there were uh, no cervical or supraclavicular uh, lymph nodes appreciated. And her heart and lung exam was normal, her reflexes were normal, and she had no tremors. So what's next? I will review uh, the evaluation of thyroid nodules in pregnancy, um, which is essentially uh, similar to uh, the evaluation of thyroid nodules in the non-pregnant population, with the exception that the thyroid scan and uptake are contraindicated in pregnancy. And this is because all maternal radionuclides uh, could potentially result in fetal irradiation or fetal hypothyroidism. So upon discovering thyroid nodules, a complete personal and family history, a clinical examination, thyroid function test, um, thyroid ultrasound, and if indicated, an FNA um, uh, should be performed. Um, the history is focused on identifying um, uh, features that are likely associated with malignancy, such as history of uh, neck irradiation, or exposure to ionizing radiation before the age of 18, uh, history of familiar thyroid cancer or the tumor syndrome predisposing to thyroid cancer such as the uh, MEN2 or um, uh, carnet complex. Um, age less than 20 uh, is um, more associated with uh, malignancy in thyroid nodules and other um, elements of the history that could make you think of a rapid tumor growth or um, a vocal cold paralysis. Um, or if the patient reports any um, enlarged nerve nodes or any signs of uh, distant metastasis would be very important um, uh, to um, uh, get this information. And then all patients should have a thorough palpation of their uh, neck, um, estimation of the thyroid volume, and um, uh, appreciate uh, different features of the, of the thyroid nodules, and of course, evaluation of the central and lateral left nodes. Now, coming to, to blood tests, uh, all women with a thyroid nodule should have a TSH measurement performed. And um, if uh, this is found to be abnormal, then an uh, assessment of the thyroid hormones should take place. T3 would uh, be checked only if the TSH is low to assess if the patient has overt uh, hyperthyroidism. Um, however, remember that in, in, T, in pregnancy, the lower of uh, limit of TSH um, uh, for a uh, good decrease. Uh, so it might be uh, difficult to differentiate um, uh, if this TSH is uh, low, for example, for pregnancy, or if this represents a uh, potential um, nodular autonomous uh, function. 
So for women with suppressed uh, serum TSH levels that persist beyond 16 weeks of gestation, uh, FNA of a clinically relevant perinodule uh, may be deferred until after pregnancy. And at that time, if the serum TSH remains suppressed, uh, a nuclear scan uh, could be done to evaluate the function of uh, the uh, nodule, uh, provided that uh, the woman is not uh, breastfeeding. Um, there's um, no universal recommendation for checking calcitonin in pregnancy, uh, but a, um, it should be considered for um, pregnant women with a family history of uh, medullary thyroid cancer or MEN2, or uh, if they have a known uh, red mutation. Um, in the presence of, uh, uh, of the thyroid gland, um, there is um, no utility of um, checking uh, thyroglobulin, and that's not uh, recommended. Moving to the thyroid ultrasound, um, this is the most accurate tool uh, for uh, detecting the thyroid nodules and uh, determining their size and location and um, obtaining a description of the nodules' sonographic uh, features. Um, thyroid ultrasound does not use um, radiation and therefore is safe during pregnancy. Uh, so a thyroid ultrasound with a survey of the cervical left nodes should be performed in all uh, pregnant women with known or suspected thyroid nodules. Um, in, in this systematic review uh, of 31 studies, um, uh, it was noted that um, different individual um, uh, ultrasound features um, are not necessarily uh, accurate predictors of thyroid cancer, looking at the uh, likelihood ratios, with uh, perhaps the exception of um, the cystic nodule and spongiform nodules that have a, a high positive likelihood ratio to predict uh, benign nodules. So in the latest ATA management guidelines, for adult patients with thyroid nodules and um, thyroid cancer, using uh, sonographic patterns to predict uh, the risk of malignancy uh, for thyroid nodules is um, uh, recommended. And um, you can see here that uh, starting uh, at the bottom, a completely cystic nodule has uh, less than 1% uh, risk for malignancy. And in that case, um, uh, no FNA is uh, indicated. Um, moving to uh, a very low suspicion uh, pattern of um, a spongiform uh, nodule, for example, the risk for malignancy is less than 3%. And in that case, an FNA would be recommended if the thyroid nodule is at least um, two centimeters. And as you can see, as we go uh, higher and the uh, level of suspicion increases, the FNA threshold also uh, decreases. So uh, at the end, um, when we have a, a nodule with a high suspicion uh, pattern or intermediate suspicion pattern, uh, FNA is recommended uh, if the nodule is at least uh, one uh, centimeter. Um, the ATA classification of uh, sonographic patterns has some disadvantages since some nodules have no pattern or category. So uh, for example, um, uh, we're not sure of what kind of um, uh, risk of malignancy should we consider for a nodule that uh, is like isoechoic or hyperechoic, but at the same time has, let's say, micro calcifications. Um, so uh, some are using the uh, TRAD system which has been endorsed by the American College of Radiology. It's a point-based system in five areas uh, that are used to uh, estimate the risk of malignancy and provide biopsy uh, thresholds. Um, you can see here an overview. Again, um, the nodules are evaluated in, uh, for composition, ecogenicity, uh, shape, margin, and ecogenic uh, foci. And based on that, they're getting their points. And we have, again, the different categories uh, ranging from benign uh, to highly suspicious. 
Um, so going uh, back to our um, patient, um, by history, she was asymptomatic, so she was noted to have a palpable thyroid nodule during the examination, uh, but then there was no lymphadenopathy. Um, you ordered a blood test for her, and um, the, the TSH was found to be normal, and uh, then proceeded with a neck ultrasound um, that, as you can see, uh, showed a 1.6 centimeter thyroid thyroid nodule, uh, solid, hypoechoic, uh, with regular margins, so there were no suspicious um, uh, features and there was no lymphadenopathy. And based on uh, AT the ATA uh, system, um, this nodule will have an intermediate risk of uh, 10 to 20 percent. Uh, so an FNA would be uh, considered uh, if the nodule is more than one at least one centimeter. So should she proceed with the RNA? Um, the uh, ultrasound guided uh, FNA uh, has a goal to collect groups of cells for cytology, and it is the most accurate and cost-effective method for evaluating thyroid nodules. Um, the fine needle um, aspiration biopsy, including the common practice of using uh, sub-Q lidocaine, uh, is a safe procedure uh, during pregnancy and could be performed in any trimester. Um, two retrospective case series uh, of FNAs performed during pregnancy involving a total of about 100 patients have been published. And uh, based on those um, uh, publications, pregnancy doesn't seem to affect the diagnostic accuracy of FNAs. Um, however, there have been no prospective studies to evaluate potential differences in FNA cytology obtained during pregnancy versus a non-pregnant uh, state. So, uh, based on this, in the latest guidelines of thyroid nodules in, uh, for the management of thyroid nodules in pregnancy, a thyroid nodule FNA is generally recommended for newly detected nodules in pregnant women with a non suppressed TSH. The determination of which nodules require FNA should be based upon the nodule sonographic pattern and the timing of NA, whether that would be during gestation or early postpartum, may be influenced by the clinical assessment of cancer risk or uh, by patient uh, preference. Um, so uh, proceeding um, an FNA in the context of pregnancy, should not be an automatic, like immediate action. We need to remember that we're not managing a thyroid nodule, but a pregnant patient who has a nodule. So um, the decision should account uh, the clinical context, including the, the patient's uh, level of concern and anxiety, uh, patient's risk factors for thyroid cancer, uh, the clinician's role and the clinical setting. And uh, considering these and the patient's overall goals of care, uh, a dialogue uh, has to take place between the clinician and patient. Um, so then they can both agree on a patient-centered diagnostic plan. So for example, think of a pregnant woman who has a very, a very low suspicion uh, thyroid nodule. Um, and despite that, she, she's very anxious, she's telling you, she, she keeps thinking about it, uh, she cannot sleep. In, in that case, it might make sense to proceed with FNA, which hopefully will show uh, a benign thyroid nodule, and then this patient can continue her pregnancy without any uh, additional anxiety. Um, uh, shared decision making um, is uh, basically the, the cornerstone of patient uh, center care. Um, and it goes beyond uh, a simple information exchange. Um, so decision making then has been noted to improve knowledge, improve satisfaction uh, with the decision, and even improve engagement in the decision making. And it could be used uh, either to discuss um, diagnostic decisions or even uh, treatment decisions. And I want to emphasize that to provide patient-centered care, we need to ensure high-quality conversation between clinicians and patients in, in whom um, uh, thyroid FNA is considered. 
And the reason I'm saying this is that in a recent uh, recent survey that um, we did in a large academic center, um, we found that after undergoing thyroid biopsy, a high proportion of well-educated patients remained unaware of uh, their thyroid cancer risk. Um, they uh, uh, were not um, uh, quite sure of uh, the potential outcomes and uh, even the downstream consequences of uh, the biopsy. So it's very important to have a very uh, a good and detailed discussion uh, in order to uh, approach a, a well-informed uh, decision. So going back to our case, um, our patient had this 1.6 centimeter thyroid nodule and um, her estimated risk of malignancy was 10 to 20%. And after um, having this discussion, the patient decided to proceed with FNA, which was performed at the 13th gestational week. And um, uh, thankfully, uh, the cytology result was consistent with a benign uh, thyroid nodule. So, what would be the uh, monitoring uh, of benign thyroid nodules during pregnancy? Um, well, um, these uh, women do not require any uh, special surveillance uh, strategies. The follow-up would be the same of um, compared to uh, a non-pregnant population. So um, it's determined by the risk certification based on the ultrasound pattern. If the, there was high suspicion uh, nodule, then uh, it would be reasonable to repeat an ultrasound and FNA within 12 months. Um, if it was low to intermediate suspicion, uh, repeated in one to two years, and it was very low suspicion, there's definitely limited utility, but if you decide to repeat, that will be at least after two years. Um, and indications for repeating the FNA would be if there was a significant growth of uh, defined as a more than 20% uh, increase in at least two nodule dimensions with a minimal increase of two millimeters or more than a 50% change in the thyroid volume. Or of course, if, the, if there were new suspicious ultrasound uh, uh, features. Um, similarly, uh, if let's say the nodule uh, was not meeting criteria for FNA, uh, then um, the uh, surveillance would be the same with um, the non-pregnant population. So, Again, we'll be using the risk stratification um, to um, make our decisions. And if the nodule um, had a high suspicion, then it would be reasonable to repeat the ultrasound in six to 12 months. If it was low to intermediate suspicion, I repeat in uh, one to two years. And uh, if it was very low suspicion or poor cyst, again, um, uh, if you would consider to repeat, uh, that would be at least two years later. What about levothyroxine therapy? Um, well, studies uh, have shown that um, levothyroxine suppressive therapy has a, a modest efficacy in nodule volume reduction. Um, data supporting levothyroxine therapy in non-TSH suppressive doses for prevention of thyroid nodules are incomplete. And there are no data to guide recommendations on the use of levothyroxine therapy in patients with growing nodules that are benign on cytology. So the uh, current ADA guidelines recommend against levothyroxine suppressive therapy in this um, case due to the side effects of uh, iatrogenic thyrotoxicosis uh, with potential harm both uh, for um, the mother and, and the fetus. Um, so now what if you have a patient who has benign thyroid nodule but experiences uh, significant compressive symptoms and, they, and we really want to avoid surgical intervention? We know that um, the management of thyroid nodules um, uh, has um, uh, advanced uh, with uh, using techniques such as um, uh, alcohol sclerotherapy and radiofrequency ablation, but their use in pregnancy has not been studied. I found this study from Hungary of um, 13 patients uh, that underwent uh, percutaneous ethanol sclerotherapy in pregnancy. Uh, and um, although um, not all of them uh, had uh, success based on uh, ultrasound features, uh, that study reported that uh, the uh, compressive uh, symptom, the significant compressive symptoms uh, ceased in uh, all patients. 
Um, of course, this is a very small study, and to my knowledge, um, I haven't uh, seen this um, uh, replicated, but it would be something uh, to consider. So I have to admit, um, the case I presented, of, it was a hypothetical case, and I chose to give a closure uh, with a benign result because uh, basically that would be the most common scenario. But what if our patient was found to have an indeterminate third nodule? How would we proceed um, with management? Um, Following uh, the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology, uh, indeterminate nodules, including a TPM of um, undetermined significance or follicular lesion of undetermined significance and follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm, um, could be uh, followed by uh, doing molecular markers or lobectomy. Uh, but in pregnancy, where uh, we want to avoid uh, surgery as much as possible, um, that can uh, uh, pose a um, significant uh, diagnostic uh, dilemma. Um, also, in uh, pregnancy, uh, uh, molecular marker testing has not been validated, and it is possible that changes in the uh, nodules RNA expression um, may occur during gestation, uh, altering the performance of RNA-based uh, gene expression tests. DNA-based tests are theoretically less likely to be affected by pregnancy, uh, but uh, overall, uh, due to the lack of evidence and concerns regarding accuracy, molecular testing cannot currently be recommended for evaluation of indeterminate thyroid nodules in pregnancy. Um, so uh, the uh, latest uh, uh, ATA guidelines um, uh, support that uh, pregnant women with uh, cytologically indeterminate uh, nodules, including the suspicious for malignancy, in the absence of uh, cytologically malignant left nodes or other signs of metastatic disease do not routinely require surgery while pregnant. Uh, and during pregnancy, if there is clinical suspicion of an aggressive behavior in a cytology indeterminate nodule, that's when surgery could be considered. So overall, pregnant women with uh, cytologically indeterminate thyroid nodules could be followed conservatively during pregnancy especially since there are no prospective studies evaluating the prognosis of these women, and because the majority of these nodules are later found to be uh, benign. Um, so moving now uh, to the management of uh, a malignant thyroid nodule, Thyroid cancer is actually the most, second most common cancer in pregnancy, uh, preceded only by uh, breast cancer, uh, with 14 per 100,000 um, uh, live births prevalence. 10% uh, of all thyroid cancers occurring uh, during childbearing age are diagnosed during pregnancy or within one year of delivery. Uh, and most common histological type is papillary. So we know that surgery is traditionally the initial treatment of differentiated thyroid cancer. However, the decision to pursue uh, surgery during pregnancy um, uh, might uh, versus waiting to do so postpartum uh, depends on a variety of factors. So the management of differentiated thyroid cancer during pregnancy poses a number of diagnostic and therapeutic challenges, both for the mother and fetus. So the decision uh, should be uh, preferably be taken by a multidisciplinary team uh, consisting of endocrinologists, surgeons, OB, radiologists, and even neonatologists. Uh, Looking on the risks for surgery, uh, uh, first semester uh, is linked with the unacceptable risk for uh, teratogenicity and miscarriage. And um, uh, in the third trimester, uh, there is risk for premature labor and delivery and potential hypotension due uh, to compression of the IVC that could lead to uh, fetal hypo hypoperfusion. Um, in several studies with small uh, size um, have um, assessed women undergoing thyroidectomy during pregnancy and uh, most of them have taken place to the second trimester uh, showing that there have been um, no difference in complications um, in uh, this um, oh, i'm sorry 
in this um, uh, US population based uh, study of um, 201 uh, pregnant women uh, compared to eight smart non pregnant women, um, there, uh, there was a, a multi variable uh, analysis that showed that uh, pregnancy was an independent predictor of higher uh, endocrine and general complication rates, longer adjusted length of hospital stay, and um, higher. Uh, adjusted hospital costs. However, um, uh, these results should be carefully interpreted as there were significant baseline differences between the pregnant and the non-pregnant um, women. Um, more uh, recently, um, a retrospective uh, study of uh, 45 pregnancies, uh, including uh, 24 women uh, with DTC that underwent surgery uh, during uh, a pregnancy, with most of them during the second trimester of pregnancy, were compared to 21 um, women who underwent uh, surgery within one year of delivery. And in this study, uh, there were um, uh, there was no difference uh, between like surgical between the groups uh, in terms of surgical complications, uh, miscarriages, or, or birth uh, defects, uh, leading the authors to conclude that uh, surgery can safely be carried out uh, in the second trimester. Um, so um, thyroidectomy during the second trimester uh, it may involve the lowest risk for the mother and fetus um, and is considered relatively safe, but still it's very important to, to remember that the risk of post-operative maternal hypothyroidism and possible hypoparathyroidism. Um, and that can be a, a very challenging situation uh, because, for example, let's say uh, the TSH uh, fluctuates. You don't know if this is uh, because um, uh, your levothyroxine dosage is incorrect or is it because um, as we saw the TSH might be changing during um, gestation. Um, and it might be hard for the woman to um, take the level of her oxygen, let's say, four, hour, four hours apart from uh, their calcium supplements. Uh, so at the end, uh, a lot of women might be actually over or under uh, diagnosed, underdosed. Uh, that could lead to some adverse effects in uh, uh, both uh, for the mother and, and the offspring. Uh, so that's pretty important to remember. So um, next thing we need to think is how pregnancy may affect uh, thyroid cancer progression and uh, prognosis. This has been uh, a heated uh, debate, um, mostly because uh, there are not many studies, many of them are pretty old, they have focused on papillary thyroid cancer, and uh, there's um, no randomized trials um, assessing this. Um, this was a, a systematic review in 2011, and I made a small collage here. Um, uh, older studies um, I have um, uh, showed that there is no difference in the survival between uh, pregnancy-associated thyroid cancer and age-matched uh, non-pregnant women uh, with DTC. And um, in this study, for example, from uh, Musa and uh, Masaferi, um, the outcomes were similar in patients who were operated after delivery uh, versus uh, during uh, pregnancy. Um, however, uh, it's also important to remember that um, in these studies, more than 99% of uh, uh, the uh, pregnant and non-pregnant women had actually stage 1 disease. Uh, so that could be uh, uh, limiting uh, their, uh, their general ability. And um, uh, this study uh, from uh, Vanucci in, in Italy uh, evaluated uh, 14 um, uh, patients. And um, uh, in this study, um, it was found that um, uh, pre uh, pregnancy was associated with the increased persistent uh, or recurrent disease. And that finding was related to the presence of high estrogen uh, receptor expression levels in the thyroid tumor cells. Um, however, uh, the patient sample, uh, as you can see, uh, was uh, small, 
and um, it, it was noted that the majority of cases with persistent disease um, uh, were attributable to biochemical elevation of ferroglobulin uh, levels uh, or ferroglobulin antibody levels, um, raising the question of whether uh, the pregnant women uh, underwent a less extensive um, initial resection. So again, uh, these findings should be uh, interpreted with uh, caution. Um, in support that um, uh, pregnancy uh, does not uh, lead to a significant um, uh, progressive of, uh, thyroid cancer uh, is this study by uh, Dr. Ito. Um, uh, in this uh, cohort, uh, women with uh, papillary microcarcinoma were followed with active surveillance and uh, 15 uh, women uh, uh, underwent uh, pregnancy during the active surveillance and you can see that only uh, four patients uh, had a change in the size of their um, uh, PMC uh, by at least uh, three millimeters. And at the end, uh, out of those four women, um, two uh, underwent operation after surgery and two continued with surveillance. Uh, there was uh, no uh, woman that developed a nodal metastatic disease during pregnancy. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, this study provides uh, um, uh, some reassurance that um, pregnancy does not worsen the uh, prognosis of uh, thyroid cancer. Um, so, with all this in mind, um, indications for proceeding with surgery uh, uh, for thyroid cancer in pregnancy uh, would include an aggressive histology, uh, for example, like anaplastic or, or a poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, if um, uh, there is locally advanced disease or metastatic lymph nodes, uh, or if there's significant growth of the malignant nodule before week um, 24 or 26 of uh, pregnancy. And I would add here also if uh, there are severe compressive symptoms. I, I try to put this in, in a little uh, graph. Uh, so the idea would be that uh, during pregnancy, if you have uh, a malignant nodule uh, that um, shows uh, aggressive histology or severe compressive symptoms, you can proceed immediately with surgery as delay could potentially affect outcomes. But when, uh, for the most cases where we have a well differentiated um, uh, a malignant nodule, um, uh, you will proceed with surgery if there are no dull metastasis or very significant growth, and surgery in that case would be preferably in the second trimester. Uh, but if there are no complications, uh, then uh, surgery can be done postpartum, and in the meantime, uh, because higher CLTSH levels may be correlated with a more advanced um, stage of cancer, uh, levothyroxine therapy could be considered for TSH score of 0.1 to 2, and in that case, the thyroid function test should be uh, checked every month, and of course, an ultrasound um, should take place every uh, trimester. Um, no radioactive iodine uh, in pregnancy, and the, the use of tyrosin kinase in, inhibitors uh, should be um, uh, really limited um, as uh, they could uh, have uh, potential um, side effects for, uh, for the fetus. So we talked earlier about shared decision making uh, when discussing the diagnostic step of FNA in a scenario with high stakes or uncertainty, uh, such as authority. A more detailed conversation regarding the thyroid approach should take place, um, taking into account the clinical and ultrasound features, the FNA results, and of course, patients' values, preferences, and context. Uh, our evidence so far shows that there is no harm due to delayed treatment of a low risk, well differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, and therefore, uh, in that case, um, we should balance the operative risks and complications during pregnancy um, uh, with. Uh, uh, the outcomes in prognosis. Um, and our current data really uh, support a more conservative approach uh, for pregnant women um, with thyroid cancer. Um, so given this, um, still reassurance of the patient is critical. Trying to get someone to uh, 
weight and uh, knowing that they have uh, thyroid cancer uh, it can be a month it can be tough especially if it's for several months so it has to be uh, a clear understanding uh, that uh, for pdc that is not harmful um, sometimes if it's needed for patients reassurance you can even offer uh, ultrasounds more frequently than each trimester and it's also important to discuss that there is no risk of malignancy to the fetus which often could be like a secret primary concern for for the woman so uh, our talk was emphasized in newly uh, diagnosed uh, thyroid cancer during pregnancy uh, for women who have a history of uh, DTC uh, there are some considerations um, and um, in this table I have summarized a, a few taken from um, a, the paper from uh, Dr. Papa Leontiu. Um, so uh, pre pregnancy should not be uh, 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 pursued in uh, the first six months after radioactive iodine. It's important to maintain uh, the same TSH suppression goals in pregnancy and increase the thyroid hormone dose by approximately 30%. And um, genetic um, counseling might be needed uh, if there is um, a concern for uh, red uh, mutations. So my take home points are that thyroid ultrasound and FNA are important diagnostic tools for thyroid nodules in pregnancy. Um, there is um, no use of um, thyroid scan and uh, molecular markers and uh, levothyroxine suppressive therapy is contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, timing of surgery for pregnant women doesn't seem to uh, uh, alter the outcome for thyroid cancer and it's very important to follow a patient-centered approach. And with this, I uh, will uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Great. <clears throat> Dr. Maraca, thank you for a really outstanding presentation. Got a number of questions that have been um, directed, and I uh, want to just start off here with um, a, a few of my own. Can you comment on the safety of CT and MRI uh, during pregnancy if there's a need to evaluate? Um, either invasive or high volume nodal disease in patients that are um, diagnosed during pregnancy? Uh, yes, uh, so um, CT um, uh, would have like a, we know that it has ionizing, uh, there's, there's radiation. So uh, usually uh, CT scans are uh, not um, indicated in pregnancy or not used in pregnancy, but of course, like any kind of imaging should be uh, uh, considered in the setting of what is your suspicion of what's going on. So uh, again, if you're if you're concerned that, for example, your patient is having anaplastic thyroid cancer, um, then um, it, 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 this the benefit of obtaining the imaging uh, might outweigh any risk for for uh, for the fetus. So uh, again, that should be something that has to be carefully considered. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and can you comment on how dogmatic you are um, in terms of the appearance of lymph nodes um, in a patient that other, that you either newly diagnose uh, during pregnancy or um, you are uh, inclined to do active surveillance? Um, are you, uh, is it in your mind an, an absolute in, indication to intervene during that second trimester? Uh, uh, that's a good question. And, you know, uh, as, as, um, as one that we don't really have that much of data. Um, so, uh, I, again, it would be important to assess how much the burden is, uh, how many potentially lymph nodes are involved. Uh, for sure, um, that uh, this should uh, be evaluated with FNA to, to confirm uh, if they're malignant. And in that case, again, um, I think it would be important to um, uh, individualize this to each patient uh, because there's definitely some uncertainty so I wouldn't say that you know it's an absolute indication uh, but it it would definitely um, increase um, a, like make you lean more towards surgery rather than active surveillance if the left nodes were already involved uh, but again um, that should be something that has to be thoroughly discussed and um, and decided together with a patient. 
Okay, mm -hmm. terrific. Um, we have a question regarding the uh, delay of um, instituting radioactive iodine in a patient who um, is either diagnosed um, and treated uh, during um, their their pregnancy um, or soon thereafter. Um, how long, how comfortable are you with a delay and how long would you uh, consider um, radio, uh, delaying that treatment? Well, I think in, in this case, I, I guess you, um, the question would be involving like a, a, a woman that um, uh, had the, the surgery during pregnancy in the second trimester. Uh, I think in that case, uh, it would be reasonable to wait uh, uh, the three more months uh, for uh, the um, delivery of the baby and, and have the radioactive iodine therapy then. Uh, I mean, even with non-pregnant uh, patients, sometimes we, we give the radioactive iodine up to like three months later. So uh, I don't think that there will be a significant um, effect on the prognosis. Now that could affect um, the breastfeeding. Uh, so um, I-131, Cannot really uh, should not really be given in the in a breastfeeding woman, um, uh, also because it could also lead to um, uh, irradi like uh, radiation in the breast. Uh, so if uh, depending again how like how high risk the, the patient is, if um, um, I would say that if the patient is really high risk, then and you don't want to delay much further, then a discussion about maybe. Uh, uh, not proceeding with breastfeeding and proceeding with the radioactive iodine uh, needs to take place. Uh, but definitely, um, I would wait uh, uh, to perform the radioactive iodine therapy after the delivery. Okay. Now, um, in light of the fact that any surgery that's performed uh, for, for a diagnosis of thyroid cancer and during pregnancy is almost assuredly going to be a total thyroidectomy, um, based on criteria. Can you comment um, just for a moment about whether there are specific challenges of treating um, a complication such as hypoparathyroidism um, during pregnancy? Um, how is that more difficult than um, in patients who are, are not uh, pregnant? Uh, so I kind of um, made a, a bit of comments uh, regarding um, the risk of the maternal hypothyroidism and uh, hypoparathyroidism. Uh, so uh, definitely that is a, a bigger challenge compared to, to non-pregnant women. Um, so uh, regarding uh, the hypothyroidism, um, we discussed already about um, the challenges of like how to, to dose the levothyroxine. Again, the patient's weight is changing. Uh, they're taking their vitamins. So be like if there's concern about the absorption. Um, similarly, for hypoparathyroidism, again, that would require um, uh, more calcium. Um, again, it would be hard to, to if, if they require like um, um, frequent um, calcium, as usually you know, with hypoparathyroidism, uh, it might be like twice a day. Again, it will make it more hard with the levothyroxine. Um, in pregnancy, um, there might be um, uh, less vitamin D. So definitely uh, you start with a disadvantage. So it can be very challenging. Great. <clears throat> well, listen, I would like to thank you. Um, for uh, a really um, outstanding educational forum this morning. Um, and um, in finishing up here, I just want to make one programmatic note, and that is the next Friday, February 19th, um, we will not be conducting a session in light of the fact that uh, the American Thyroid Association is having an online educational forum. And so um, we will. Uh, come back with um, a, uh, our next session on February 26th. Um, Dr. Orloff will be uh, presenting on ultrasound of the neck with a focus on lymph nodes and also um, what is emerging as um, interesting ways for us to image the function of the vocal cords uh, using ultrasonography. Um, so with this, um, I, I um, uh, thank again uh, Dr. Maraca and also 
um, wish everybody a wonderful President's Day weekend and everybody stay safe. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.